Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks everybody out for coming. Um, tonight, we're gonna have a couple guests up here on the panel. We're gonna be, uh, sell, I mean, RCA is gonna be bringing you the uh, next Building Resilience Summit uh, at eight. And we're gonna be talking about dealing with moving beyond trauma, I'm sorry. Moving beyond trauma and we'll have a couple guests. Uh, our first speaker being uh, Brian Tomasello. And then we're gonna have, if they can make it, uh, William Palmer along with Kurt Morris, currently held up in traffic as we speak. So maybe uh, they'll be uh, jumping in um, as we proceed. And also I like to thank the Public Library of San Francisco and uh, Rachel for extending their hand with us and just helping us out to do this thing. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Rachel because she has some things to say as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you all for being here. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things from the San Francisco Public Library. Uh, we are recording this event, so anybody who does not want to be recorded, please stay toward the back. And the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, shortly. There's public Wi-Fi. If you need to connect on your phone, the cell coverage is often not good down here, but you can go on the public Wi-Fi on your phone if you need to. Uh, the restrooms are out this door past the stairs and to the left. And I want to read the um, San Francisco Public Library land acknowledgement as we start all of our programs. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramai Tush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramai Tush community. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Returning Citizens Association for our program. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, Rachel. We appreciate the invite. Um, yeah, so we're a ground root organization. Um, we just starting out. And so um, with that being said, um, we will be, uh, there will be some kinks because we learn as we go. And also, uh, where organization is always trying to expand. With that being said, um, we offer things too. We don't like to just ask for donations and like feel like we just straight begging. So we got things that we offer as well that people can subscribe to like podcasts. We have a clothing line, Returning Citizens Association clothing line as well. And you can go to the website and you can purchase these things. But we do take donations as well. We accept Venmo, PayPal, um, donation slips, checks, all that. Um, so moving right along and um, just give you kind of like uh, some of my background. I'm Ramon Day, I'm a returning citizen, um, although I never looked at it like that until I started talking to Rick. And so uh, a returning citizen is somebody who's uh, probably been incarcerated and returning back to the free world and trying to make the adjustments minus the trauma, although that would be hard to do because um, there's a bunch of trauma involved anytime you're doing uh, time, whether it be from you or your loved ones at home or just some of the things that you go through. Um, so yeah, tonight we got three speakers, like I said earlier. And we're going to have our first one um, come in tonight, I mean, speak right now, which is my man, Brian Tomasello. Yeah, yeah, bro. We, hey, man, listen, I don't bite, man. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, for those of you here, my name is Brian Tomasello. Um, I am a formerly incarcerated life-term inmate. I spent approximately 18 years in prison. 
I went to the parole board five times before I was ultimately granted parole in 2011. I was 21 years old when I went in, and I came home when I was 38. Today, we're talking about moving past trauma. Uh, trauma has many facets <clears throat> for the incarcerated population. Uh, one would be that the initial arrest. The initial arrest is uh, devastating to not only the victims of the crime, but also your family who you victimized as well by not being present in the home. There's a way to, to look at that period in your life and say, what was that turning point for me uh, of understanding the behavior that allowed me to believe it was okay to commit this crime and harm people who, quite frankly, um, did not deserve it. No one deserves to be victimized. <clears throat> and one of the things that I had to do was take a, a moral and a self-inventory of myself and come to the realization that my thinking was not of, source, of a social norm, nor was it what uh, people believe another human being should act like. As a result, I began to uh, take uh, programs that assisted me in understanding why I was acting a certain way, why I uh, allowed myself to feel that uh, I could take what I want without repercussion. Um, and ultimately, after having gone through that period, I began to start writing curriculum to help others empower themselves to understand their behavioral uh, deficiencies and try to work on growing as an individual. <clears throat> so moving past trauma for me was one, understanding myself, and two, wanting to give back. Because once you start giving back, then you start feeling better about yourself, feeling better about the people that, that, that you're involved with, um, and, and helping others so that they too will not fall in the same trap of, of a thinking, um, what's up Kurt? so that they too would not, would not fall in that trap of that particular behavior. Um, you know, so when, when, we, when, we, when we discuss uh, moving past trauma, um, you know, one of the most important aspects of my uh, rehabilitation was I was fortunate enough to have uh, a great many friends ultimately understanding who those great many friends were that I could count on my one hand towards the end. And my family, first and foremost, because I was one of the fortunate persons who was incarcerated where I was lucky enough that the people who were in my life prior to me committing my crime continued to love me, support me, and offer me the encouragement to be better than, than that. And, um, you know, I never wanted to put my family in another position where they had to see their son go through a traumatic experience of, of having to literally, you know, be in a cage. You know, many people talk about what it's like to be locked up. And everyone, for the most part, most everyone here today knows what that experience is. And, it's not, it's, it's, it's not something that one can put themselves in unless they themselves have been in it. And for example would be, you know, when we talk amongst ourselves and we say that we are in a cell, a, a six by nine cell, well that, that literally is the truth because I can remember when I was in San Quentin or Folsom I would have my shoulder on one side of the wall and I could reach out and I could touch the other side of the wall and that was the, that was the width of the cell. And, you know, and that, that, in, that, in, that, 
in that box, which one of our members likes to quite frequently use um, as a term, um, you know, that's exactly what it was. It was a box. And, you know, in that box you have your two bunks uh, and, and a little, little toilet and a, and, a, and a sink. And that was life um, for a great many years for many of us. And that in itself is a traumatic experience. That in itself of the uh, dehuman, dehumanizing uh, experience of not being somebody any longer, but now being a number to the system, because that's ultimately what we, what we were, J67752. That was my number. <clears throat> and it's something that I'll always have uh, as a part of me. But the beautiful thing is that number doesn't define who I am today. That number is not a representation of me. That was a representation of a man being rebuilt, a man saying that enough is enough, that I'm gonna help others around me, that I'm gonna empower others to think differently, and that I'm gonna offer opportunity to those who are now coming home with employment. Because I went from being a life-term inmate to now being a person who runs two facilities, a multi-million dollar business, I'm a general manager, I manage over 75 people, um, I have a great amount of responsibility, and that to me was the stick in the system's eye because I did not let the system define me. That's right. I didn't let it define me. Yeah, so that was, that was, that was huge. Yeah. You know, um, the system has a tendency of, you know, when, again, I go back to I was very fortunate to have people that loved me and cared for me and that came to visit me often. But the irony in a person who has people that has a tremendous amount of support, the system has a way of trying to discourage those folks from, from supporting those people, right? And what they do is they make it very difficult to visit the loved ones. They, you know, oftentimes they've turned women away, uh, family members um, away because their clothes or uh, underwire bra or, or whatever it might be. And it's a humiliating, uh, it's a humiliating aspect of, of visiting. Um, you know, and, and I, I, I really took offense to that um, when, when I was incarcerated. And, and again, what I did is I became part of a, of a committee um, because I felt like, like I was, I was well-spoken enough to be able to advocate for the rights of others. And, you know, and I was put in a position to where I would be able to speak to the warden directly. The warden would walk the yard with me directly. And, and, and all the while, I still maintained who I was on the yard. I was still one of the guys. They knew I wasn't going into the lieutenant's office and telling. They knew I wasn't doing this. But what I was doing was I was representing the people who were incarcerated. That's what I did. And I did that wholeheartedly. And, and I made changes, and I made, I made some significant changes um, because what I can do uh, as well, not only speak, but I can write very well. Oftentimes, I write better than I speak. And, um, and so, so I was able to make things happen uh, within one of the uh, institutions that I was incarcerated. <clears throat> uh, I had this traumatic experience that... Uh, actually it, it, it facilitated this whole movement within me. Uh, I was um, with a young lady at the time when I was younger and, um, and she was coming to visit me often and you know she came in the visiting room she gave me a kiss and what they did is apparently there were cadets up in the uh, in the 
up in the room in the tower and they watch the videos of all the visitors and they're making sure no inappropriate actions are taking place, the smuggling's not happening, whatever the case might be. And when this young lady had given me a kiss, she put her, her hand on my face and they came in and I said, oh, someone's getting it. <laughs> the goon squad came in and I said, yeah, someone's, uh, someone's going right now. And little did I know it was me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they came and got me. And um, what they did is it was, it was one of the most humiliating things of my incarceration. Um, it actually, um, it broke up my relationship with the young lady that I had uh, because of it being so traumatic for her that she never wanted to experience that again. <clears throat> and for myself, um, what it did was it, it, it really broke me down um, to the point of, of helplessness. I was already in a position of hopelessness, having been a lifetime inmate, but also helplessness. Because once they get you, there's nothing you can do. And when they brought me into the room, and as everyone knows who has been incarcerated, they strip you down. And when they strip you down, when they're taking you to a specific watch, they have you put on boxers frontward, backwards, then they put a jumpsuit on you, and then they put a jumpsuit backwards on you and they tape your ankle, they tape your thighs, they tape your waist, and they tape your arms. And then they take you into a holding cell, and then they process you, and then once they process you from that holding cell, they take you into a cell. And once they put you in that cell, then you're now shackled to a bed. And every time you have to use the restroom, you have to notify the officer who's watching you. And then that officer has to call the sergeant, and you have to wait for the sergeant to come. And when the sergeant does come, then you can finally use the restroom. <clears throat> so this was a process that went on for over three days for me. Even though I had already completed what they had asked, they, they still were fishing. They still thought there was something inside me that was going to come out, and it never did. To me, that was the most degrading, humiliating experience of my whole incarceration. But, again, moving past trauma, right? I got to it. I was like, all right, they got me. They did this to me. It's another way for them to try to beat me down. It's another part of the, the system's uh, uh, hold on an individual where they they dehumanize you and turn you into that number and that you are to remember that they're in control at all times. But they weren't, man. They weren't. They were temporarily, but they weren't after that because once I got out, man, I hit the gate running. And that was it. And so I started doing paperwork. I started looking at all the, all the, all the doms. I started checking out everything that they had as far as like what their procedures were. And... And then I started following up with paperwork. And then I started making change. And I started hearing, people started listening. And then I had other people's family members getting involved. So it was a, it's, it's much like RCA, right? Returning Citizens Association, economic and political capital is what we're trying to achieve, right? Because in my line of thinking, in my time of being incarcerated, it came to me as being each one teach one. Right? Each one teach one. So I'm here today as each one. And I'm here today hopefully teaching one. Right? Because that's what I want to do. That's, that's my position of giving back. I took, and now it's time for me to give back. So the parole board for me was another very traumatic experience. The parole board for me was during a political climate in which it was phrased that no life term inmate will ever go home other than leaving in a pine box. And that was by Governor Gray Davis. The political climate was changing during the Pete Wilson administration 
when the poly class unfortunate situation took place, and that's when the tough on crime really began to get tough. And they never wanted another, another lifer to come home and then be that poster child for their political gain in trying to get into office. So they felt that if they kept a, the life term population inmates incarcerated, it would help them with their political stance on being tough on crime. <clears throat> get them a vote. To get them to get them the vote and get them funding and 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 the CCPOA at that time was one of the most poli powerful political unions in, in not only the state in the nation, yeah. in the nation, and um, and so you know you know we see it today in a lot of the um, you know law enforcement activities that oftentimes happen that are very you know egregious, um, but. You know, that's how the, CCOP, uh, the CCPOA operated as well. I mean, they operated on their own terms. I'm getting off track, and I don't mean to, but I'm just kind of giving a little, little history as far as the system was concerned when I was incarcerated. <clears throat> Life-term inmates weren't going home. The, the prison population exploded. Uh, Overhousing uh, was, was at an all-time high. Uh, it was at 170, 100, anywhere between 162 to 170% capacity. Uh, you went from two bunks in uh, a dorm style living to now three bunks in some of the dorms. Um, and then they started taking away the programs. Um, and there were a lot of things that were caught it, causing a great amount of, of, of mental, um, mental issues within the population because people didn't have the outlet to get out to the yard, to get the fresh air, they're stuck in the cells, they're stuck in the, in the building, and it was horrific, it was horrific. So that's what I was faced with during my time, during my time. And once I, once I, I begun going to the Board of Prison Terms, finally, uh, to seek release, you have to, go through a set of things of uh, making sure that you have employment where other other inmates that had a had a date they didn't have to you know secure employment before being released letters of support residency you name it it all had to be put together so i go to my first parole hearing and my first parole hearing i uh i walk out with a one-year denial and for me, that was, a, that was a win. That was a win. And I felt very confident going into my second hearing that, that I was likely going to receive a date. But that was the whole hoax. They keep you, they keep you there, you know? They, they want you to believe that, that, that there's, there's that chance. When in fact, everyone on that parole panel was either former law enforcement, DAs, or, or Sheriff, whatever, you name it. Victims' rights advocates. I'm not, take, I'm not taking anything away from, from, you know, from what their, their positions were from the victims because, you know, some of them went some, through some very horrific and, and traumatic experiences themselves. Um, but I don't feel that they're fit to judge an individual to be released because it becomes a, more of a, a vendetta and a vengeance, and I'm going to make sure. So that being said, I went into my second hearing, and uh, they started this new tactic of denying people parole based on lack of insight. So if you did not have the insight into which you committed your crime, all the things that led up to the crime and your understanding of the crime and how you would respond today in many ways, um, then that would be a basis for denial. And it became a boilerplate language. Everyone was being denied based on lack of insight. So I went from a one-year denial to a two-year denial. Now, a two-year denial was the max they can give me because I had a kidnap robbery, kidnap ransom. 
<clears throat> so I go into my third hearing. And, and now I'm just trying to get back to one. Because I know they're not going to parole me, but I want to be able to get in front of them as many times as possible so that I can, and without having the years extend, because I'm getting older and, and life starts passing you by at this time. You know, things, uh, you start realizing, like, you know, am I going to have the availability to be married, have children? Am I going to have the opportunity to get out uh, uh, young enough to be able to see my nieces and nephews when they're young and, and support them as well? Uh, so, so things start to weigh on you heavily mentally. I go into my third hearing. My third hearing was the same as the second, lack of insight. Lack of insight denied another two years. I go into my fourth hearing, and, and I went into my fourth hearing, and they felt as if I was getting close to potentially receiving a parole date based on my programming and everything that I've been doing, uh, college education from Ohio University, uh, multiple, uh, and then I got a few other uh, degrees um, and what ended up happening is the DA had the victim's family come to my parole hearing. So I was one of eight involved in my crime. One of eight. One of eight, and I was the youngest in the group, and I received the most time out of the eight. I didn't tell. I, I just, I, I wrote it out, you know? I just, I took it for what it was. <clears throat> and my lawyer at the time was a wonder, he was a wonderful man. He was a, a, a prison rights advocate and, and very well respected. Um, he came in and, and told me while I was in the holding cell that the victims were there. But interesting enough, it didn't set me back. In fact, I was actually happy about it and welcomed it because I felt out of all the people involved in my crime, I would be able to be the one who would give them comfort in knowing why they were chosen as victims or why we did what we did and, and hopefully allowing them to have the, the forgiveness of my action. And it worked out like that. It actually worked out like that, but I still got a two-year denial. <laughs> and that's okay, because I went back feeling better about it. I went back and I was like, okay, like I know they're never gonna come again. And they didn't. My fifth hearing, they didn't come. But at my fifth hearing, the laws changed. The laws changed in my fifth hearing. The fifth hearing, they had a law that came out, I believe it's called Marcy's Law. And Marcy's Law now required the Board of Prisons terms when they find an individual not suitable for parole, a person in my circumstance who can only receive a two year maximum can now receive a three, five, seven, 10, and 15 year maximum. So now when I go in front of that parole board, I'm no longer looking at a two year maximum, I'm looking at a three year minimum, a three year minimum. 37 years old. Three years is going to put me at 40. And then when I get back at that three years, what's going to happen then? A lot of things happen in the prison system. You know, a three years is an eternity. Three years, anything can happen. Anything can happen in three, any, one day. I mean, that's, 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 that's how we live in, in incarcerated. We're day to day. Everything's day to day. So when you start talking about three years, you're talking about an eternity. I see. You're talking about an eternity. So on this last hearing going in, 
it was, it was, you know, a very stressful period. I knew I was prepared. I knew I had done everything that I could possibly do. I knew that, that, you know, I would be able to articulate, you know, prior uh, behavior, what I did to transition from that prior behavior, and who I am today as an individual. I knew I could do all that. But it's not me that's judging that. It's, it's people that is beyond my control, and they have a political agenda. But fortunately for that day, when they came back from deliberations, they said to me, we find you suitable for parole. I can't tell you guys, like, it still shakes me up today because, because finding you suitable for parole, five words changed my life. Five words allowed me to be the person I am now. Five words allowed me to be a married man with two children. Five, five words allowed me to buy a home and be a, a manager of a multi-million dollar company. Five, five words. Five words. So, you know, I just want to say that, that, you know, it's possible. And the gentlemen that are here today, most often there's more of us, but the gentlemen that are here today we, too, have experienced this. We, too, have experienced what it was like to go through that period of incarceration to come out survivors, because that's what we are. We survived it. We survived it. So for me, Ramon, that's in a nutshell as far as, like, moving past trauma, moving past trauma and knowing that, that for anyone, Anyone that, that, that finds themselves in a traumatic experience, there are tools, there are resources, there are people who have gone through it as well and are here today, and they too stand, they, they stand tall. They stand tall. It's, it's possible. Thank you. All right, let's give Brian a round of applause. Thank you for sharing your story, brother. Okay. So, so again, um, being that this is, I'm sorry, I keep looking back <laughs> at the uh, sign, but yeah, Building Silence, uh, Summit Series A, and Moving Beyond Trauma. First thing people got to know is because, especially for a lot of us, the way our lifestyles are, are the way we're brought up, and the things that we're brought up into, the trauma is normalized, so we don't even be knowing that we be trauma you know? We don't even have our idea because the things that happen to us, we think they're supposed to sometimes when they don't. Like, you know, at a certain age, you, you know you're going to the penitentiary because from elementary, you know, that's just how it is sometimes. So you don't know these things. Um, when certain things happen to you, you think it's supposed to because of your upbringing and things like that. And um, so, like, for instance, when you go into the court system for a ticket or not, what, a ticket but a case or whatever, another person could have the same kind of case you got, but they won't get what you got. So you normalize in your trauma because of your upbringing and things like that. Um, <clears throat> Um, sharing with, with just listening to, 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 to Brian and just like some of the things that he was talking about from the pat down searches is, is just total overkill. He's not, he's, he's not lying when he tell you that they try to break your families up just from people coming to visit you with the restrictions that they put on your visitors, not just you, but on your visitors as well to discourage them from um, coming to see you half the time. These people are trying to break up your family if you got one. And they do it with a vengeance. Like they, they not, I mean, they disguise it well, but if you got a little common sense, you can see through it. The, um, the way people are impacted, like 
we 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 incarcerated and we just thinking about woe is me, woe is me. And we ain't even thinking about like, thank God for my wife. She helped me make it through that same thing. And what happens is you get so centered on you that you don't think about them and what your absence does to them because it's people that depend on you. And so um, I listen to this man every week and it was having him right here next to me that made his story just that more impactful. So again, thank you brother for sharing. Um, we gonna keep this train rolling. We gonna give y'all about five minutes, take a break, get you some refreshments and we gonna get right back into it. Our next speaker is gonna be Curtis. I had no idea that um, I was returning citizen. It took Rick to make me realize that because what happens, I'm thinking right now we might need another host. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking, um, you know. But I think you should just agree. <laughs> I'm gonna do that too. <laughs> but but no, what I'm saying is like, so like so like your mindset can't can't stay locked as a, as a second class citizen because so I'm a felon, right? Um, the minute the minute you leave the gate and you think you're free, is when you find out you're still some more difficulties that follow you because now you're a felon. Um, it's only going to be certain jobs you can get when you come home because they're going to run a background check. Um, if you got violence, you can cancel out a whole lot of stuff. If you got fraud, you can cancel out a whole Like, you ain't never working at a bank again. Forget it. Um, and you might be good with numbers. You might be an accountant. You're not doing it. Um, and so I'm a stereotech. Stereotech is a person that... Um, we clean instruments or we, we uh, sterilize them for surgeries. So it's a whole lot of red tape and, and, and it, took, it took my mind state to not label myself as a second class citizen, to knock the door down to get back in a field that I actually love and not accepting though because it was, it was um, a whole lot of application filling out with family members because when I get home, um, I don't really know about that computer game like that. So. <laughs> I got my wife helping me. Um, her friends and them was writing me resumes. Everybody sending me in and stuff like that. And you just keep getting turned down because the only thing you get to go to is labor ready. But my labor wasn't ready for them. You know, my labor was ready for a hospital, something I already been into. Um, real discouraging. So even though they're trying to take you down to the Second Class Citizen Act, everything about me first class and I gotta keep that mindset. And if you don't, you will fall by the wayside. So with the resilience of this man, that's why he's in a position he's in. With the, with the resilience of this brother right here, that's why he's in a position he's in. And um, you have to have it. And the other thing is this, returning citizens associations say that it should be no there should be no uh, stuff made without us, about us. And that's right because I could go back to paroling and having a, a, a parole officer, Mike Mermerstein, I'll never forget his name because he, he, he was foul. You know, um, I paroled, my, my mama was a registered firearm carrier, registered through the state of California. So they knew when they got the paperwork, because you know, you gotta go parole to your mamas if, if you ain't got your stuff together. You gonna be at mom's. So I paroled there. She, she, she um, tell these people religiously about the firearm. They say, long as it's a lock, there's no problem. He can, he can stay there. He comes to the house, you know, because they gotta come to buy your house at least twice every 30 days to do the little home inspection and, and that stuff like that. He come by and he, he cool and he cool and he cool. But about 90 days into my parole, he wasn't cool no more. 
And it wasn't nothing I did because I came home, got a job and everything. But just like that, out of nowhere, came to my mama's house, arrested me, and told me I couldn't be in there because she had a fire on. Now the twist to it is, in hindsight, he know he out of line and he know that it's foul. But me being a rookie, cause I ain't never been in trouble. I ain't been behind no bars, no juvenile, no none of that. I went to school then, that part. And so what happens is, so now I gotta have a meeting with the board of prison terms for the, for the prison violation for having a firearm. My mama come to the hearing I'm leaving one part out on the way of taking me to lock me up for a gun violation. I told him he wasn't shit and I beat his ass. That's just out of anger and immaturity, but it cost me. So when we get to the hearing for this incident, I beat the gun charge because he didn't have no right to come and arrest me. But now I got a new charge because I threatened a parole officer. You know what I'm saying? We just sharing how it really be working like behind closed doors and stuff don't nobody know about. That's one of the things happened to me. And you know, that sets you back because I just got a good job then. So now I got to start all over again. Then I get in there and then I'm doing something else I ain't supposed to be doing. Then I catch some more time all behind a bogus gun charge. And um, again, trauma we be trying to normalize because we think it's supposed to happen to us anyway just because of the situation we in. And yeah, um, so that's what returning citizens is about and so that's why we trying to get some of our people in play in these positions, whether it's parole officer or, or getting them on a, a board of prison terms or getting them to go back off in these facilities and start being counselors to individuals getting ready to come home and having resources for people when they come home. Like he, he mentioned uh, letter writing. You know, if you could write, write a letter for a brother and it improve his situation, why wouldn't you? You know, it, it, it takes five, 10 minutes and if you, if you gifted with words like him, it's just gonna be a blessing to receive it, you know? That's where we at, but um, returning citizens, this is our mission to try to improve people who come home from being incarcerated and make it as smooth as you can and have resources. So um, again, I just gotta throw this in there for the people, we do take donations. You can come to rca.com uh, we got Venmo, we, we offer you podcasts, we sell magazines. Like we ain't just ask you just to donate, like we gonna give you something for your donation. So just keep that in mind because we have to have resources to try to help some of the people come home. Um, I don't wanna keep going on rambling, so I'm gonna hand it off to Kurt, but I just want to share an incident with you on, again, like how we normalize some of these things that happen to us and think it's supposed to happen when really it's not how we just normalize trauma and the reason we trying to move, how can you move past it when you don't even know that you in it? So without, with, with that being said, we gonna hand it over to Kurt. Thank you, sir, thank you, sir. How y'all doing, y'all doing good? <laughs> My name is Kurt, I'm um, Silic's cousin, I'm Ricky's cousin. Um, we grew up in the, um, in the um, same neighborhood in Pittsburgh, California. We good now? Okay. Uh, we grew up in the same neighborhood in um, Pittsburgh, California. Mic, they want to hear you. <laughs> there you go. All right. Can we go? We good? We good? There you go. Yeah. All right, yeah. So, um, like I said, I'm Ricky's cousin. We grew up in the same neighborhood um, in Pittsburgh, California. So, we um, kind of cut from the same cloth, and we was um, raised doing the same thing, just hustling, and that's what we seen when we was outside. And um, so that's why I'm so proud of him for getting this organization started with RCA. And so um, RCA means so much to these people because it's not just us. You know, it's a non-clinical um, um, group that we have on Sundays that we can get around and talk and just shoot the stuff and come up with ways to try to help people that's been incarcerated and people that's out that need resources. Um, my father, he's been incarcerated like my whole life. He's been there 52 years. He's in Solano right now. Um, a little bit on his thing, he, um, 
was convicted of killing the, um, the first, is two police officers killed Martinez and he was convicted of killing the first officer Martinez. But um, so me, I really didn't have a fear about going to jail because my, my life, I was impacted on the other side because I knew my dad was there, you know, and he was like my hero. So it was like, so what? If I go, my pops, he got my back. So it didn't really mean nothing to me. And then being out in the streets, seeing the hustlers, that's just, that's just what, that was just part of life. You get caught, you get caught, you do what you gotta do and then survive. And so, like I said, me and my cousin, we came up hustling together. He was a little bit younger than me. Um, I'm in my 50s, he's just around like 50. So um, um, he hung with my other little cousin that got killed. Um, you probably, he was an um, entertainer. His name is um, Frico, Chico Gaines. And he got killed um, back in, um, I think it was 16. Went to the All-Star game in, um, in, um, in LA. And he, unfortunately, he was shot out there. But um, with my pops being in jail, though, like I was saying, he was like a hero to me going up there visiting him. So, you know, sitting on his lap and just sitting up there, he showing me all type of stuff. And so I didn't really, it was nothing really different for me to see. And so um, when I went back home, like every time, um, like I said, I didn't care about going to jail or anything like that because I knew my pops was gonna have my back and it was just a situation. So I ended up getting myself in trouble. And so um, I'm a returning citizen. I went to Hawaii for four years. I went from 14 to 18. Unfortunately, actually, I had got 10 years total because they were saying they were going to keep me there until I was 25. But um, by the grace of God, I was able to get out. So I was arrested for that um, particular crime back in October 10th, um, 1987. And what's so odd is that my life started October 10th, 1993. That was when my first son was born. So a bad day turned into a promising day. And then, so, you know, I, I just thank God for, like, changing that day. I get emotional when I talk about it because it's just, like, crazy how God, the grace of God is real because I've been in situations where I shouldn't have came out. You know what I mean? I've been in households or standing with some people, some characters, that I shouldn't have walked out of that house. But by the grace of God, I did. And I still was living in a different type of life. So that's why I just, like, especially with youth, my part in RCA, I'm trying to get youth programs where we can have people can take their kids to Great America and Six Flags because the father's not there. My father wasn't there. So it's just like you stuff like that that I want to be able to introduce into our program and be able to help single mothers um, going through different stuff like that. My mother, straight queen, she passed away um, a few years back in 2002. Um, in, um, but she was so smart enough where she took me out of the Bay Area and took me to Sacramento. When I got parole, I got parole to Sacramento. Whole new life. That's when I started. These are two of my other sons over here. Um, I was able to have these two sons, and then my life just kept evolving. Like I said, back in 93, I had my first son. Then I had my next son and, um, in June 4th. So I took that June 4th, and I said, what do 6-4 mean to me, his birthday? And so I haven't got my other two sons yet, so don't feel bad over here. My other, I got one that's 531, I got one 427. But I'm in the middle of my life. I still got two more sons to go. And so these dates mean something. But the 6 four, you always hear when you talk about life, or when you play a game, right, you play to enjoy it. So I look at life as being like a game, you know what I mean? And we're here to enjoy this. We're, when you play a game, you wanna enjoy it. And that's what we should be doing with life. So when people take like, um, you, you hear the saying where you say, um, we're not playing um, checkers, we're playing chess. It's 64 squares in there, that's six four. That's my other son, it's my life. Everything I do now is move for my kids. I love my kids to death. My kids know when I look at them, they daddy love them, they father love them. I do anything for my kids, they'll tell you that right now. They know that. They know when I look at my kids, my kids saved my life. They changed my life. Even when I got back out of jail, I still was involved in some mess, but knowing I had those gentlemen to take care of, I respected them gentlemen, and I called them, I called them gentlemen, I called them young men. I don't, I don't call my kids up there and they, ain't hey, don't got no, I was a knucklehead. Ricky was a knucklehead, my cousin was a knucklehead, we were knuckleheads. These guys never gave me no problems. They went through their regular stuff at like school. They ain't never disrespected me. They ain't never stood up to me. And I talked to them, I call them young men, I call them gentlemen, yes sir. You can look at our text. That's how I refer to my kids. And that's how, I, and I, because if you give your kids respect, then they gonna demand respect from people. And I don't teach them no junk. You know what I mean? Um, I, I, just, I just love my kids and I want them a better life than what I had. And so they're not gonna see me in prison. They're not gonna be coming to visit me behind bars. And that's just what God has led my steps to be. And um, I appreciate you, I love you guys to death, and you guys know that, and you guys can get anything from me. You know what I mean? But um, most of all, um, uh, like I was saying, my thing with RCA is just to improve and to better people's lives. 
God has put me in a position where I'm winning. Like I, when I get back to these games, don't try to cheat life. Don't try to cheat games because when you cheat, you lose. I, I don't want to win life because when you win, it's over. The game is over. I want to keep winning with the ING. I don't want to win life. I don't want to be the biggest dope dealer or the biggest this or the biggest that. That's when you try to win something, you try to master something, that's when you lose. That's when you, I don't want to lose the game. I want to keep winning. I'm going to keep making my steps on my 64, on my 64 chest. When I'm, I, I use people, I want people to be queens for me. Queens not in gender wise, meaning women. I want people just to be, I'm going to be the king of my chess boards. You can play multiple chess boards. That's our situation that you're in. And I want to be the king in each one of those, but I want to build queens around me. I have other people that's around me that's helping me build, but I want, the more queens you get, the more, my mom, she was a beautiful queen for me. She taught me different stuff. I miss her so much because when I was in jail, she was on AFDC, but she still sent me packages. She still, she still made moves to make sure her son wouldn't go back to jail. She put me out that environment. She knew if he comes back to Pittsburgh, he's going to get killed. He's going to follow steps to his dad. My dad never got out of jail. Me and him would have hooked up together. Do you know we would have been terrible? We would have been terrible. We would have been terrible together. So it's a reason why that man stayed where he is in that position, and I stay where I'm at so I can raise these young men to be who they are. They, he loves when he sees them. You know what I mean? And I'm not wishing bad on him or nothing like that, of course. You know, I wish I could have my dad. We ain't never even watched a 30-minute program together. We ain't never shared really a sandwich together. You know, and that stuff hurts. You know, when you think about it. But I say God has guided my steps so I can be able to help people. I took so much from the community. Now I want to give back to the community. And um, I know we're supposed to go a little longer, but um, that's basically my story, kind of like in a nutshell. You know, keep winning. Everybody keep winning. And like I want to say, um, I get teary-eyed because I'm praying all the time. I, I look at individuals that's here, and I always try to think what's going on in each person's life that's here and try to portray that message or relay that message to a person. And so I want to, I'm not here to touch one person. You know, you hear somebody say, oh, just one person can hear the message. No, I want everybody to hear what I'm saying and know what I'm talking about Sweet. and be able to be able to help by me. You know, I want to be that person now. I don't want people when they see me, I want them to be smile when they see me. I used to have people before that used to like tuck away, duck away. Oh, he going to do this. He going to pat my pockets down. I'm not that dude no more. I'm a happy dude. I'm winning. I'm winning. I got four beautiful sons. You know what I'm saying? I don't owe nobody no money. I don't owe nothing. I got cars. I'm good. I'm winning, and I'm going to stay winning. And thank God. Amen. And that's me, y'all. All right. So, <laughs> so you know, um, on, on, on our uh, Sunday edition uh, therapy classes slash podcasts, um, Kurt, he always got his screen off. You know, he don't never got his screen on. So I always heard him speak. He's real articulate, right? And, 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 and I don't know, man. Like, when, when I hear him, you know, uh, some of y'all might be too young for this, but, and this might tell some of y'all age, but you know when E.F. EF Hutton talk, everybody listen. And that's how Kurt is when he be talking. I, I love to hear him speak, man, because he's always direct, precise, and, and his word pronunciation is just on point and everything. But for the longest, I was like, can't wait to see how this brother look. I know he about 6'2", you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Carved up 250, you know? So, I, so when we do the fashion show and I finally see him in person, I ain't disappointed because you can still see the confidence that ooze from the brother, right? He's just shorter than I expected, that's all. <laughs> That's all he's just sort of expected. Son, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I feel like uh, he's very, very needed in this organization. Uh, I definitely feel like he has a fit because he got the right idea. When we talking about we want to stop something, we got to stop it at the head before it starts. So when you want to invest in, the, in these kids' organizations and, and doing stuff with the kids, that, that's that's really, really important because <clears throat> we was them kids. You understand? We was them kids, man. And the difference now is these kids is different because they don't really even know how to socialize. At least we knew how to socialize, you know? 
get to them kids, cut the snake off by the head. Um, we want to thank everybody. And um, I got to do one more plug again about, you know, PayPal, Venmo. <laughs> we got a subscription of a magazine, RCA. Uh, and we also got a subscription for a podcast, $4.99 a month. Um, again, Rachel, this is powerful. Thank you. We really appreciate you. Thank you. And so if, if, if y'all, we got Q&A, if y'all want to go Q&A for a minute, that's fine. Um, we're very open to any questions, if you have any. No, you give it a mic for anybody who might have a question. And if you were the organization, you can still ask a question too. Everybody except her. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question. His name's Brian? Yes. Brian, you said letter writing, right? Yes. Because I have a friend. She has been denied, like you. <clears throat> this will be her fourth time. She's frustrated. So she's telling all of us to write her a letter. But the letter, I, I, can you help me with that? I can. OK, good. Yeah, for sure. Because <laughs> poor baby, she's so oh God. Yeah. She's just been trying. She's discouraged. She just, it's, it's bad. So yeah. she's trying to get everybody to write these letters. And I just want my letter is like kitty form. You know, it's just typical. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's a good person. She did this. She did that. But I don't think that's working. Yeah. I can definitely help you with okay. that for sure. One, one of the things that I can also help you with is uh, preparing like a parole packet for release. Um, typically what you want to do is how I did it because parole is a 50 mile radius. You can't leave beyond that 50 mile radius without having permission from your parole officer. What I did was I kind of like prioritized like uh, people who would be able to assist me in, you know, whatever facet they might, they might, you know, th their strong point might be. Maybe it might be uh, they could provide me uh, transportation if needed. Um, um, they can assist me with uh, going to the store or whatever, whatever it was within that 50 mile. And th that was my support system, local. And then everything else beyond that was, you know, um, people who would write, I can attest to the character type situation. How you gentlemen doing? Uh, question well, for you, Thanks sir. Thanks for asking, brother. What, yes, what is your name again, Curtis. sir? Curtis. Curtis. <clears throat> um, how did, you know, not having your father you know, be physically present. I mean, you touched on it a little bit, but I'd, I'd like you to expand if possible. How did you not having your father be physically present um, actually affect your drive to be, you know, the father you are for the children that you have now? I think it was um, the main goal that I didn't want them to see me in that position because I didn't want to hurt them like I was hurt. You know what I mean? So that kind of helped me in a position where I wanted to do better. You know, just far as, because you always hear about that, you want the generation to be better than yours was before. So I just kind of put that in mind that I didn't want to see that. And I, I think with God dealing with me, he was telling me those were the steps that I wanted to make. I don't want I don't want to be incarcerated. You know what I mean? I want to be out. I want to be happy with my kids. And I don't want them to have to go through the process of taking off your shoes, taking off your belt, going through the whole process and just dealing with other men. I want to be out and about, you know, and be able to teach them stuff and be able to teach them how to be proper young man. You know what I mean? They can even let you know when they get girlfriends, I tell them, if my son even think about putting his hands on you, come tell me and then me and that person going to fight. Uh, and they, they let you know. That's what I tell they, the girls that I like or whatever that I feel. I say, oh, don't touch them. Don't you? You already know you can beat her up. Well, what would you hit a girl for anyway? You know what I'm saying? So I let the young woman know. You come to talk to me, or you call me on the phone. And I come over there because I already got a, uh, a thing for them. I tell you, go get in your own car instead of getting into the police car. How, how crazy is you? Why would you go get in the police car when you go get your own car? You got a car? Go get in your own car and go down the street and keep your hands off, ladies. You know what I mean? You already know you can beat her up. It just don't make no sense. But back to your, like your question, it just strengthened me to not to see me in that position because that's what they're going. Usually, you want to do what your dad did. Like I told you at the beginning, 
I wanted to, I didn't care about going to jail. My daddy was there. I was good. If I go to prison, I'm good. Because he had been there so long anyway. You know, when I start getting to that age, 13, 14, 15 years old, he going to take care of me. When I get 18, if anybody messes with me, my pops, he good in jail. So I was going to be good. And that's kind of how I felt in that thing. And I didn't want them to get that same um, attitude to think it was nothing. But because it is something. And it's degrading. And it's, 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 it's not an experience that they need to experience at all. Definitely not. Um, pretty much it's for uh, both of you. Um, has your experiences made you hate the legal system at all, or has it affected that how you view cops or anything in general? That's a good question. Do you, yeah, you want to go? Um, I can go a little bit. Yeah. We got this thing that we do we call thorns and roses when we kind of do on our podcast, and so. I can say like the system is a, like a thorn, but without the thorns, you don't learn lessons. So I don't hate them because I think they made me a better person because if I would have kept going rapid, I would have kept hurting people. You know what I mean? So I don't hate the system. I, I grew up because of the system. You know what I mean? I hate I had to experience it, but I don't hate the system. I just wish the, experience, the, I wish the system had more revenues, um, avenues and revenues to help people instead of tear us down. Because in the car, we were talking about that. How much it would cost to, um, to um, incarcerate a person? They rather spend that money, let you get in trouble, instead of putting that money back into the community now. Um, what, what was the number again? That's what I'm saying. So why not put that money in the community now? Why wait till this person get in trouble and then put $100,000 a year to do that? You know why? Because it's corporate people that's running the prisons and that's getting benefits from it. They are the ones who's putting laundry in there. They are the ones who's putting food in there. They are the ones who've got other programs going on. So they don't mind spending $100,000 once you get in trouble. It's big business in prison. But to hate the system, I don't hate the system because it could be a good system. And some people do need to be in jail, like we were talking about. Some people do <laughs> need to be incarcerated. But some people just need a second chance or they need the, they need the programs and um, resources before they can go there. I didn't have those resources, so I went and tried to get it myself. Or I didn't know how to seek those resources. That's why I'm so appreciative of RCA that we can start putting those resources out there so kids don't have to do the same thing that I did. And my kids don't have to do the same thing that I did. Um, <clears throat> do I hate the system? No. The system's in place for a reason, number one, right? However, are there fallacies to the system? Absolutely. Are there things that could be corrected? Absolutely. And that's what happens when we vote, right? Fortunately, we're all able to vote here. You know, that's, that's, that's the power of the political process and democracy, voting. Secondly, do I have a distaste for police? My dad was a 31-year San Francisco police officer, 31 years. And when I was incarcerated, it was like I took the win from him. Right, because I knew better, so to speak. I knew better, uh, but you know, things happen in, in one's life where you know they feel that they've been victimized or wronged, and and they have resentments and they act out in a certain way. And that's one of the things that I discovered about me during the process of being incarcerated, and how I came to understand how I became capable of doing what I did. So I don't hate the system, and I do have a trust of police officers. I do have a trust because for the most part, their intentions are good. They are trying to protect the community for the most part, but you do have people like us who make mistakes, not mistakes because that's not what it was, it was the decision you have the opportunity to make the right decision, and some of these officers don't make the right decisions. That's it. Um, I, I wish I could be as modest as you two. I would love to, but unfortunately, I don't feel like that. That's your feeling, bro. Uh, I got issues with them people. But I could say, you know, now as as far as like, you know, really just being a mature young man as a po like, oh, if you would have asked me that same question just 10 years ago, y'all wasn't going to leave. We was going to be here for a minute, you know. I mean, growing up with Barbarica and Mason, Jacques Anelio, how was that for you? 
that was very terrorizing. Especially when they know you because you're just going to always be a target. And you can't have nice cars and shiny things and think you're going to ride up and down the street and not get no tickets and not get uh, your, your car stripped wide open and just because just it's you. So, so for me, and I'm glad y'all feel like that, man. But nah, nah, man. It, it's some people that shouldn't be police, exactly. period. And it's, there, there are certain individuals who don't need to be in a position that has anything to do with lining up your freedom, especially if they're going to be biased from the beginning. You know, be a great place for equal opportunists, but some of them ain't like that. Most of, just like he said, political gain got a lot to do with this. Like a lot of stuff that's they, set up in a prison system is for points. Points for them individuals who got political careers to go elsewhere. And so your casualty or how they feel about you and what they taking away from a family that love you is different for them because there ain't no feeling there. You know, I can tell you right now, and I and I know I know I ain't got shit on me. I know I'm cleaning in the board of health and everything. But when that damn police car get behind me, I'm already, I'm grabbing my ID. I'm already getting in rehearsal. I'm saying I'm rolling the window down that much, and I'm handing it through the window. Because I already showed you I have nothing to fear, and there's nothing to hide, because I stopped. Because let my wife be my witness. She'll tell you I'm a high speeder. We'll get ghosts. I'm going to see how good that Ford handle, that Ford, that charge, or whatever it is. But now I pull over just because I know I'm right. But the maturity of me now make me be a little bit more cooler. But nah, 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 y'all. I, I, I ain't got to that point yet where I could feel like y'all feel. I'm I still scared to death. I'm, I, I'm sweating. Like, it's an issue. And, and I know I ain't done nothing. And then social media don't help because now you see, you see, you see us get pulled over, and I'm not even, it's not no racial, it's just period. Like I have a problem with police. But I do know a couple cool ones though. I ain't gonna lie. So, so yeah, that that that's definitely my answer in a nutshell. I get dry mouth too when I get pulled over. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm saying. How you guys doing today? My name's Darren Williams. I am a returning citizen. I've been locked up uh, approximately 37 years. However, uh, I've been out three. Uh, I just want to say, man, the story about the cops. I just happened to leave San Francisco in 1995. Or was it, yeah, 1995. Uh, my brother's name is Aaron Williams. My name is Darren Williams. Right no. Because uh, I don't want to tell the story. Oh, you're telling gonna, it, though. I'll give you a brief little, <laughs> little thing about me. When you talk about the police, my brother, Aaron Williams, was murdered by the police. Uh, I was gave, given 35 to life for a crime I didn't do. So I did all that time. And I'm here. And this is why I don't want to sit in front of the camera. Uh, my emotions get mixed up. Uh, <clears throat> so that's just real short. So with this trauma and this series and all these other things I've been through in San Quentin, you know what I'm saying? So I was prepared for what's out here outside. You know, I could have made 50 million decisions to get back into prison. It's all kind of things out here in San Francisco for a young black man. I'm not, a, I'm not young, I'm 62. However, for a young man to get in trouble and spend the rest of his life in one of them boxes, and, they, and I don't think nobody deserves to have to spend all that time in prison and come home with nothing. Them people <coughs> kept me for all that time and gave me $100, $140. If I didn't have my own money and have my own sense to keep my account <coughs> to save 50 cents on every dollar, I wouldn't have had shit. So what I'm saying is, is yeah, I want to. Yeah, I'm a part of this for that. 
I'm motivated, pumped, you know what I'm saying, of, uh, of I'm not very healthy, I've been sick, uh, but I'm here for, I, I made it down here, you brothers, you know what I'm saying, I'm very appreciated and I respect everything that you're trying to do and I'm trying to do the same thing, but I don't have no help. You feel, do you feel what I'm saying? I, I'm just one yes, person, sir. one person army. So I need that, you know what I'm saying, that motivation and uh, those things. I talked to a few people in the mayor's office, uh, but I didn't talk about RCI, I talked about Darren. I'm, I can't do that, I've been new, I, I knew that, but, you know, I've been around a long time. But uh, so the fight is on, man, I'm here. I made it here this time again. Oh, I remember you from last time. Right, so yeah, I came we was over there, yeah. Where's Rick? You know, that was my thing last time. You see, you see what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm like, don't, don't worry about it, man. As long as, it, every, as long as everything is moving forward, then I'm, I'm willing to be a part of it. Uh, and with that said, uh, you, for the people that are here and then watch the podcast and everything, sooner or later you'll see me on the TV crying and telling my little story because it's, it's deep and uh, it's worth Probably it. Probably that day when we was talking. I remember you, bro. Man, look, man, it's yeah. worth more than money. Can even, you can't even put a dollar sign on it. I don't want to see nobody else go through that. Young or old. For sure. White or black, green or, green or purple. Color don't have mean shit. That's what prison did for me. I was prejudiced when I first came to prison. I wasn't an African. I wasn't going to talk to you, man. I got love for you just by hearing what you said. You know, I, I would have embraced you so fast in prison, it would have been ridiculous. I've always been that person. <clears throat> I've never been a, a killer until I got to prison. I was a perfect citizen out here, man. I worked every day. Got in trouble. Hanging with the wrong people. Got in trouble. Went to prison. Got out. Went back. Got out. Went back. Got out. Then they locked my ass up forever. So I'm just saying, so a person, that you, when you go through something like this traumatic stuff right here, it ain't no just one little sitting down, sit down, getting ready to clean that up. So it's going to take more than eight series. I'm just saying with me, so bear with me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to do the best I can. However, I'm one of the richest dudes in the world. Mm -hmm. You know why? Got love. Mm -hmm. The love the compassion, the empathy, and all the other things that I learned in San Quentin. Mm -hmm. I learned that in San Quentin, man. It took me 27, 28 years. I was 27 years riding. You know, people that know me don't know that. You know what I'm saying? And, and then, then one day, psh, wake up. I got woke up. Start having empathy. Start caring about other people. Mm -hmm. Then the yard changed. <laughs> And you know what I mean by anybody that's been to prison when a yard change <clears throat> and they bring PCs to the yard. The regular population don't want to be with no guys that, that, that can't stand up on their own. That's basically it. Because it don't matter what you are, PC or whatever you are. Like I said, the color doesn't matter. I ain't prejudiced. However, your situation is your situation. You make your own situation when it comes to prison. You either be a man or you be PC. A PC. <laughs> and you know what we call PC. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> blessed to never have to be one of those guys. Even though uh, I've had pressure on me like that, you know, I've done things that I didn't want to do because of prison. You know, uh, psh, come on, man, they called me dangerous. You know, and I was 245 pounds. Come on, man. From San Francisco and everybody bugging me, Crips, Bloods, everybody, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I was vicious. That's neither here nor there. So my thing is, is I want to get to a kid when I got, I remember when I started getting in trouble. I remember the age when I started turning. So what I'm saying what is, age was it? Catch, I was seven, seven years old. Didn't get in trouble, no trouble until I was 25. Lost my mom. It was always something tragic some trauma. It was a trigger. It brought in my drama mm -hmm. every time. So, uh, like I said, I, I just got home three years ago, and uh, I can say this with conviction. I should have been living anywhere in the city just from my inheritance on one side of the family, but both sides stole it because I had 35 to life. 
gave everybody a green light to steal everything. So I'm starting from this cane to walking again. You know what I'm saying? I'm starting to talk, which is good because I keep everything locked in. You know what I'm saying? I don't trust nobody. <laughs> 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 so uh, I built resilience, believe me, on my own. So what I'm saying is, is a lot of things that you talk about that I, I especially what you were talking about, I relate to that so much. Uh, like I said, I was locked up for <clears throat> a crime I didn't commit, which was first degree burglary, not first degree mur murder or second degree murder, 35 to life. My second time in prison, my second conviction, 35 to life. Two years, seven years, 35 to life. Wow, in a short period of time. So uh, talking about trauma. And I put myself through a whole bunch of it because I didn't know no better. I thought I had to be the toughest guy in the world. Prison is not about that. Prison is about finding out who you are. Mm -hmm. I know how to do it now, and I want to teach other people how to do it because I was in a gang. I was all I was in everything. You know, I used to, I used to, uh, uh, there's a brother back there that uh, <laughs> I was used to see me on the yard killing the bag because that's how I felt about doing something to somebody in prison. Somebody get me mad, this is what I'm gonna do. But every time it really came down to me really using that force that I had, I held back, which allowed me to be able to get out of prison. The last time uh, COVID got hit, people were dying on the tier. See, people don't wanna talk about these traumas. That's trauma. I'm in a cage, I can't move. A mask, what is a mask going to do? It ain't no air, it ain't even a window open in this place. Let's break the windows out. Uh, we're going to freeze it there. So it's, it's all kind of things about trauma that prison teaches you. And what I want to do is I want to release minds. I want to release it. However, I want to use it to not ever let another person, another human being, no matter what he did or how, none of that. Nobody should go through the shit that I went through. And, and you too. All of you, you shouldn't have to go through that. It's another way. It, it, uh, locking a person up is not the way to do it. And with that said, I'm out. With, with, I, got, I, I was just. There it is, man. Let it go. Get some of that trauma out. That's what we're here for. Um, Again, man, like I say, some of this stuff with it, that happens with us, man, it's so normalized that we don't even know until after the fact. It takes somebody to get up here on these board and share some of these stories for y'all to know just how impacted we've been with trauma and, 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 and took it for granted because we didn't even know the face of it. Um, <clears throat> I hope by sharing these stories it helps somebody today. Uh, appreciate everybody coming and showing up for sure. He had a question right there, and I was going to answer his yeah, thing, too. On. I was going to say, um, I appreciate um, how you got your, um, how you changing your energy, and we welcome you to come to RCA and help us out. We definitely need you, bro. Day one, as soon as I heard. Yes, sir. Rick, tell, tell me about it. I've been, I've been on board, but, you know, me being in San Francisco, it's going through San Francisco. I'm moving to Vallejo for a minute. Y'all back here in the next about me. Yeah. And so we need like-minded people like you so we can be able to help you. You help me when you tell your story, and, I, and I'm here to help you the same way. So that's why we want like-minded people in the same way so we can grow. Oh, yeah, no, no, yep, sir. I would, I would, I would. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, uh, I actually wanted to make a, 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 a sexy and a comment real quick in reference to uh, the system, right? Um, the system, in a sense, is faceless, right? Um, therefore, it's awarded the opportunity to get away with a lot of things, you know. Um, I've come to realize that in this particular country, though we use the power dynamic or the racial dynamic, it, it's a farce. It's not real, right? And we, we oftentimes find ourselves being used by the system, right? It's, it's called polarization, okay? They polarize us, meaning two different poles, putting us on each spectrum, right, to uh, 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 be enemies of one another, right? But in all reality, the problem is not necessarily with the individual people because you find that there are good people attempting to help you, right? Yet, 
uh, Lord Atkins says that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so we find that you can have great meaning when you get in a situation. You can enter into politics and you can mean well. And maybe on the local level, you may be able to uh, bring about some type of change and help people. But the further you go up, mm. right, into the going. system, what ends up happening is it corrupts. Further corrupts. <laughs> you know, because ultimately you have the ultimate incentive, which is money itself, right? And so if you have an entity that basically can get the money printed at its beck and call, then it can influence anybody's actions, right? And so you also have a political system that is based on making your superior happy. It's not on morality, it's not on principles, it's about making your superior happy. So if my only desire is to strive to make the individual above me satisfied with my particular work, then whatever it is this individual tells me to do, I'm gonna do it even if it goes against my moral compass. And this is what we see in this particular system. So we have to start to look at the root of things, right? And when we look at the root of things, if we talk about policing, the fact of the matter is we cannot forget what the inception of the police department was in the first place, okay? The inception of the police department was simply a slave catching entity, right? So it doesn't matter uh, 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 as you go along, because a lot of times we look at the gangs and we say, well, the gangs, uh, they're terrible, even though their inception may have been something positive to protect the community and all of that type of stuff. We don't go further into that and say, well, no, they started off in a good manner and now they may be doing something else. So now we have to utilize that same logic for everyone. You know, because this entity started off in a particular type of manner. Does that mean that every single police officer is a negative, uh, a hurtful, harmful, hateful individual? That's just not true. Because if that's the case, we could look at every single race, nation, creed, and there are ill elements about all of, all of us, right? But the fact of the matter is not every individual is bad. Yet that particular system, and I'm going to make this brief, that particular system, you talk, you talk about... <laughs> Uh, just the, the quota system, right? We have designed for the police department a moral responsibility. When they put on their vehicles, they come to protect and serve. That's a moral responsibility, right? But protecting and serving has nothing to do with a quota of having to have a certain amount of tickets and a certain amount of arrest and things of that nature. So when you're doing that, that takes the morality out of the situation. Because it's no longer about, well, I'm dealing with this individual because they did something that was against the law. Now it's I have to search out these individuals because I have a quota to make. And that makes that system very dangerous. That's the beautiful thing about RCA, though, right? RCA has took it upon themselves to be the individuals who are going to be forward thinking and bring about change, bring about change in the community. Ultimately, as Brian was talking about, uh, the opportunity to vote. I have my own perspective, but it is what it is. It doesn't matter. The point is, however you feel the system needs to be changed, then do your part in bringing about change in the system. And so I want to thank RCA, and I want to thank you gentlemen for, for you know the message that you gave us, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I want to be clear about something though. As far as the system's concerned, right? When we when we talk about the hate, 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 hate's a very strong word, right? It's super strong. So when we say, "Do I hate it?" For me, I, I don't like to say I hate anything. Quite frankly, do I trust it? Do I trust it? That's the key. I don't trust the system. I believe the system has the opportunity to work in a in a in a manner that is beneficial to all at times, but do I trust the system to work always correctly? I don't. We see that every day. And when we talk about the higher the levels go in government, the more corrupt it becomes. It's absolutely true. <clears throat> but the only way that you can affect change, for the most part, is at the local levels, right? Because at the local level, those folks are like you and I.
they're like you and I. They're 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 getting into a position on the city council. They're getting into the mayor mayor position. Obviously, in San Francisco, it's a it's a very you know they have their struggles now too, because why? A forward thinking, and I love progressive thinking. Don't get me wrong, I love progressive thinking because today we're here because of Rachel's progressive thinking, right? And the city and county of San Francisco is funding Rachel the ability to give us this platform here today. I love that about the city, but there's other aspects of the city that I don't like. Walking in, there's a man sitting there smoking from a foil thing openly, right? Openly. You see people walking around bent over from fentanyl or whatever else it is, needles on the street. That too is part of that progressive forward thinking, a policy that they put in place because they thought that this would be helpful, but it's not. It's, it's, it's destructive. So don't get me wrong. I don't trust the system. Don't trust the system. Can I say one thing too? I'm gonna thank you on behalf of my cousin for you recognizing that we took it upon ourselves because uh, me and him kind of had a debate going back and forth. Where I was saying, we need some formal training, we need this. He's like, no you don't. He said, you a PhD in your own right. And he gave us all that green light and told us, tell your own story, do your own thing and let people see your um, being authentic. And I appreciate you recognizing that, and I thank you on behalf of my cousin, bro. Absolutely, Anthony. You're, you're, yeah, we, we appreciate you, man. Yeah, um, I talked to him at the last event. And um, very insightful, bro, very insightful. And I love the analogy you just did. But at the same time, um, we're going to be, be in place to do these other things but then still the gatekeepers. And then it's like everybody start out, everybody start out with, with, with the intention of doing their best job, putting their best foot forward. But it, it goes back to what you said at the end of the day, <clears throat> most of them got a price. Mm -hmm. You know, and we like to, we gonna stay on it, we gonna stand on integrity, we gonna stand on this, that, and the other. But at the end of the day, the green dude that comes in there and says, man, I'm gonna change the world and I'm gonna stick to the script and this is how it's gonna be done. And then when a dude take him in the back room and say, well, look, man, if you just, I already put 100,000, 100K in each uh, one of your kids' bank account and if you look in, in your, there's a house in Aspen. But we'd like to thank everybody for coming and we appreciate y'all. Um, I just want to hear, as a gentleman, I got a question, but I want to hit on one more thing. When it, um, we talk about donations, we're not just talking about monetary. It can be your time. It could be your story. It could be you getting other people to help the organization. So donation means just being a part to help us grow. We're trying to grow. We're trying to really make difference. You know, my cousin, he's an innovator. He, he, he has a, he has a, a vision, you know, that he wants to change. He's giving back to society. He took so much the same way. And so he wants to give back. I want to give back. And so um, when you donate, it doesn't have to be straight out your pocket. Bring other people in. Bring other people to listen to our stories and have us share the same vision that we got so we can grow, so we can really do this and make a difference. We can't put all everything on the government because like we were yeah. talking about, um, we're here for each other, you know? We're on our own, like this young man was pointing out. But um, to this gentleman in the blue hat. I would just like to say, my name is uh, Clifford Dobbins, and I'm originally from Los Angeles, but um, I paroled a couple years ago up here to the Bay Area from San Quentin with uh, Darren Williams. And um, you're Ricky's cousin. Yes, sir. And I just want you to pass uh, the word to him that there's two people here that came today that were expecting to see him. I woke up this morning, <clears throat> scrolling through my phone, and I seen that they were having an event. I've had a couple opportunities within the last year to maybe catch him in Oakland, uh, somewhere on Broadway, some other place, but I just wasn't able to do it. But I got up today and came, and uh, it's significant because it says moving beyond trauma. I'm still dealing with a lot of trauma. I've got a similar story that is so, uh, so uh, similar among the African Americans, you know, uh, out of the household, out of the home, locked up for, 25 years, and you have three sons when you come in, and when you come out, all three of them are dead. The last one, 
being murdered by the LAPD in 2022. But I want to say this about Ricky. In absentia, he's not here. I was in San Quentin with him for well over a dozen years, lived right next door to him, lived on the same tiers as him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing about him I really recognized and knew, he was an innovator. His mind was fluid. Mm -hmm. He'd get up in the morning, leave that cell, and wouldn't come back till count time. And he would always speak of some type of forward project, you know what I mean? I thought he was crazy. But I see, you know what I mean? Because he worked in education, helped a lot of people that were trying to uh, hire their education. He just stayed busy all the time. And I'm not surprised that, uh, I'm not sure of all the founders of the Returning Citizens Association, because he interviewed me about a year ago when I was in a transitional home on Zoom. But um, it's, a, it's really uh, uh, encouraging. And I'm going to try to come to more of these events. Yeah. OK. You know. And then one more, one more thing with that too. Um, we'll get your information, and then we'll give you for our non-clinical thing that we have on Sundays, and we'll invite you to the Zoom so you can um, also um, talk and share your story in that as well. What are you going to say? Yeah, so you can participate. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah so we we definitely there for you. Yep, yep most definitely. And then um, back to kind of like the story you were talking about with him always being busy. I had wrote my cousin when he was in San Quentin, and before we used to call like putting money on people, we used to call putting on your books, right? So I wrote him. I was like, "How your books looking, bro?" Next thing I know, he sent me a package of books that he had written, and I was trying to put money on his books, but he's just so not <coughs> learning from nobody and just a, just a person that he is. And he sent me a package full of books, and I was trying to send him some money. I was like, "How your books look?" And he thought I was talking about the books that he was writing, the work right. that he was doing. <laughs> so that's just the man that he is. Yeah, definitely. Rachel. If there aren't any more questions today, I wonder if you all could end by just reminding people who might be watching this video how they can connect with RCA. Yeah, we got a we got a um, RCA website, and it's uh, very informative. Rick put it together, um, and then as well, um, you could tune, you could um, chime in on the uh, on the Zoom every Sunday too, from four to six. If I remember correctly, the website has a chat box that pops up. So someone could go to the website and say, how do I get the Zoom invite Correct. Okay. for the Sunday meeting? And I think they could probably get the Zoom information through there. So you know what I'm saying? Rachel being such a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. So the, the website is uh, uh, RCA, R-C-A, at Returning Citizens Association. So that's, I think, that, I think that's the um, dot that's org the email. That's the email. So I think you want to go to the dot org one. Oh, you give it the email. Here, let me give it to you real quick. There we go. Yeah. So the re I'll, I'll give you the email anyways. It's RCA at Returning Citizens Associate Associ. So that's R E T U R N I N G C I T I Z E N S A S S O C dot org. R C A at Returning Citizens Associ dot org. That's and the it. website is going to be um, Returning Citizens dot org. And um, no, it's Returning Citizens Associ um, dot org. So Returning Citizens Associ A S S O C dot org. Yes. And no, and there is an S on citizens at the end. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.